Hello, everyone. You're listening to Digital Builder, a podcast brought to you by Autodesk, made for construction professionals who want to hear from those on the forefront of construction technology. If you're looking for conversations centered around where the industry is going, this podcast is for you. Each episode will feature a conversation with a construction industry leader. Together, we'll dig in on themes related to connected construction and discuss where the future of the construction industry is headed. Now let's get started. Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode 13 of Digital Builder. I'm your host, Eric Thomas. Today, we'll be discussing sustainability, innovative owner-driven building strategies, and one owner's initiative to build 40,000 economically and environmentally sustainable tech-enabled housing units across the United States and British Columbia by 2030. For the first segment of the show, we'll unpack this ambitious project and learn more about how this owner has set the bar high with their use of technology and sustainable building methodologies. We'll follow that by discussing how other owners can start to replicate their progressive approach with a glimpse into selecting the right technology to get the job done. This week, I'm joined by Randy Norton, founder and chairman of the board at Multigreen Properties, and Levi Noss, director of real estate development, also with Multigreen. Thanks for joining me on the show today, gentlemen. I'm excited to dig in, but let's start with some background first. Can you share how you landed at your current roles and what sparked your excitement for sustainable construction and progressive building methods? Randy, how about you go first? Well, I stumbled into this because in uh, the last several years, we've lost money um, trying to pursue the best practice of delivering attainable housing in the United States. And through each uh, mistake and failure, we kept getting better and better in our processes and technology, and eventually uh, linked up with Levi. And ever since that happened, my life has been so much better. And the uh, the incentive to uh, to be better is is definitely uh, oftentimes a cost one. So that that makes sense. And I'm glad the you know the joining of forces has been productive. Levi, how about you uh, share a little bit of your background with us? Sure. Well, so I've been in the construction industry for the last 20 years. You know, my background has been doing things like civil engineering and architecture, but I threw those away and stayed on the construction side and really grew a passion for uh, technology that enables our productivity and transparency in what we're trying to do out there on the job site. Uh, Like Randy said, I I came across him uh, in a project a few years ago, and we've just been having that dialogue, you know, over that time. And He's invited me to join Multigreen in this initiative, and I have a, a true passion for finding homes for, for people in a sustainable and lifestyle way. I really like hearing about the partnership here, and it's going to be fun jumping in. And, you know, I'm especially excited for this episode because it's the first chance I've had to feature an owner-driven story on the show. And from my earlier conversations with both of my guests today, they've made it clear that multi-green approaches building with an emphasis on, you know, cutting-edge building strategies, modern tech, and sustainable building methods. And so I'm really eager to learn more. But before we dive in on all these exciting topics, I'd like to start with learning more about the goal we mentioned earlier, especially considering that building 40,000 sustainable housing units by 2030 is an impressively ambitious goal. Randy, can you start us off with a high-level overview of the initiative? Thanks for that question. The initiative began when, again, Green Mesa Capital, as a single-family office, was allocating capital into this space and we just thought that there would be a more efficient and productive way of doing it if we had a program if we could standardize if we could get economies of scale and that itself is a technology but to do so you got to invest in infrastructure and digital infrastructure specifically so right now there's about 4.6 million houses that are required in the united states just to get to equilibrium That does not include any of the dilapidated homes or the homes that should be um, bulldozed and raised. But just to get to equilibrium, we need to build 4.6 million units by 2030. And our thought was if we could just build maybe 1% of that, um, you know, that would be an initiative worth uh, noting. But everyone's arguing how much supply uh, out there is really needed, and I think it's far understated. Um, it's far more than 4.6 million. And by the time 2030 comes around, um, with the demographic changes, um, the net migration and job growth in very specific cities, 
you're going to see an imbalance not only from a nationwide perspective, but it's MSA specific. So this 40,000 units, I think, is just our initial goal. After 2030, I would expect us to do far more. I really like hearing you unpack the the need for this. And I, I think especially in the United States, everybody's very familiar with the, the current housing crisis that we're, we're dealing with uh, here in the Bay Area where I live. You know, it's it's kind of madness as far as, you know, people bidding and it's really only a, you know, a party for the wealthy right now. So hearing your attempt to, you know, tackle some of this problem is just, uh, you know, really encouraging to hear. And so this this might seem like a silly question, but can you define sustainable construction and green building for our listeners? You know, I know they're common phrases, but I do think that sometimes people mean different things when using them. And I'd love to set a baseline as we get into this conversation. Levi, I'd love to hear your comments too. At a bare minimum, every one of our buildings needs to be either LEED or Green Globe certified, period. And we are trying to build high performance into the most inefficient property type, which is multifamily. That requires us to look at energy models very early on. That requires us to incorporate technologies very early on. And, and unless we are at the table, you know, from a lean approach, um, we're going to have all of those opportunities missed. As we're the final owner of these assets and we will hold forever, we need to know exactly what we're putting into these buildings and doing it in a sustainable way. We can also manage our material, our capex, and our supply chain in perpetuity. And that's where Levi comes in. You know, for me, the, the key differences between sustainable construction and green building really is the, the process to make your end product of being a green builder. So uh, during that construction process, uh, in both processes, uh, you know, we need to have something that's economically friendly, that's earthly friendly. Uh, and these solutions all have to balance out the, the affordability, the lifestyle, uh, you know, all of our energy consumption, utilization of these buildings. If we design poor, they won't get utilized. Uh, and while responding all to these uh, environmentally friendly methods. And I'd also say, Eric, that we have to look at each stakeholder and they will define it differently. We've identified at least five stakeholders to a multi-green building and about 560 job functions that are required to make it a multi-green way type product. And those five stakeholders are the lender, the investor, the developer and the general contractor, the resident and us here at Multigreen as employees. And when all of them can communicate and collaborate in a very professional way, we will deliver a better and more green sustainable product. I like to hear that, you know, the, the intentionality associated with all of those stakeholders at the beginning of the conversation has such an impact for the entire construction process. But I think just at the end of the day too, the, the overall life cycle of the building when they're operating it and the residents are living in it, the, the end goal is, is so much better at the end of the day. So I, I'm happy to hear that your process is really, you know, focused on all of those stakeholders to ensure that that collaboration and communication really brings this project across the line. And I'm, I'm interested to learn more about the green building principles you're leveraging in order to bring so many units to market this quickly. Randy, can you touch on that a little bit? Yeah, when Levi and I started to collaborate on design and design build and learning how to deliver this product in the most efficient way, to start, we are doing two things. We are measuring every project from an internal rate of return as well as an impact rate of return. And the impact rate of return comes from the body of knowledge that was defined in the Social Value Investing book written by Howard Buffett and Bill Emick. And from there, we get more granular into this property type and asset class. As you know, we signed the UNPRI, Responsibility, uh, Investment for Responsibility uh, Principles. We have been a long fan of the UN uh, Sustainable Development Goals. And then we get into the Green Globes, LEED certified projects of the USGBC. 
but every organization out there is helping us. The Urban Land Institute with their green print, the International Living Future Institute, and there's a net zero energy efficiency goal. Um, we are collaborating over 80 frameworks into a very specific measurement tool, which we call the impact scorecard. And if these projects do not achieve the outcome that we desire, our investment committee and or our impact committee can shut it down. The way you're building these processes out to, you know, really, truly ensure that you're creating sustainable building and sustainable projects is, is incredibly impressive. And I know that building methods like prefabrication and modular construction often fit into the narrative when talking about sustainable building and development. Levi, can you share how you're leveraging these strategies to be successful at the scale you're planning to build at? Look, we're really looking at building out a standardized design catalog of units and building asset types, uh, which give us the ability to do volume quickly. If you think of it a little bit as a Lego set, you know, we have all the parts there and the composition of those Lego sets give us the uniqueness in each project in each building. Working with the same consultants and partners and manufacturers helps us to reduce that reset and that learning curve and really begin to build out that volume. And it feels like there's been a lot more attention on prefab and modular construction, especially in the last year, um, simply because builders are able to, you know, do more work in a controlled environment versus having people on site. So I'm hopeful that with the, the, the gentle nudge from the pandemic and, you know, thoughtful insight from leaders like yourselves will get closer to the mark and leveraging these tools to, you know, both increase safety and sustainability and so many other positive of things that come from um, modular and prefabrication and, and all of these other methods that, you know, most certainly are not new, but are getting, I think, a new lens on them in the last um, year and a half in particular. Eric, let me just add one comment to that. As an owner and as an investor in real estate for over seven years, just at Green Mesa, and as a second generation uh, real estate professional, we have been looking everywhere for investment opportunities where we could invest in green buildings and they just were non-existent. And the only way that we could find the investment product that we wanted is we literally had to go create it. Thus, the creation of multi-green. It's, it's ambitious, but incredibly impressive. And I'm, I'm, I'm happy I have an opportunity to learn a bit more about all of this from you today. So I think this is a, a great moment to change gears and learn a little more about the how behind becoming a tech-enabled, sustainability-focused owner. And I really appreciate how candid you've both been as your journey as an organization, or about your journey, rather. And each of you has mentioned to me previously that you consider yourselves to be an open source shop when it comes to strategies associated with green and sustainability and all these other really important initiatives that you're under undertaking. And so I'd like to dig a little bit deeper and I'm going to give you a hypothetical. So imagine you're an owner who's been building for a decade or more, but you've recently discovered a passion for sustainable construction. If this owner has similar aspirations to what your team here at Multigreen has created, where should they start? It's very expensive and cost prohibitive. You need a very substantial amount of resources, financial resources to start, number one. And number two, you have to have an unwavering commitment because everyone along the way from attorneys, design consultants, general contractors, subcontractors, and property managers um, are going to be defiant that this is the wrong way of doing it. And so you have to have a very long-term horizon uh, in that perspective. But I would say you need to work with others that are like Tesla in that they're open source with their IP but yet like Apple and that they're active, you know, they're, they're proactive and they're uh, advocates for the consumer uh, with data privacy. We want to look to like kind culture. And if you get the right culture, anything is possible. So go and find people that you can work with that want to do this. You know, for companies that's looking to, to start all this up from, from scratch, that's an existing business that's been out there for mi multiple years, they really got to look at their DNA. You know, what is the DNA of their of their company? You know, do they have any sustainability initiatives going on? Uh, what is their culture of? 
And I think that's something that's been really successful with multi green here is within built into our DNA is that that tech enabled that thinking to lean to be lean to be green uh, and really building out that culture and the, your, the peripheral of that culture, as Randy was alluding to, it's not just the company itself. It's the people you work with also have to be following that same agenda. I would say that 10% of this is technology and 90% of it is people. And I really mean that. You can go get all of the best systems and none of them will be used. None of your software licensees will ever be turned on. Uh, none of your data will be accessed. It's getting the right people. In this business, I think it's gonna require a lot of younger, you know, tech forward thinking individuals. Although, you know, in the future, at the end of the year, we're gonna be hiring a 65 year old experienced professional that is very tech, tech savvy and BIM oriented. And that is a cultural fit. Yeah, I think just surrounding yourself with the right people, like you said, is is the the gold standard there. And the exciting thing now is we're we're at this moment, this inflection point with the construction industry where a lot of people were encouraged to move into digitization at a pace that they probably weren't anticipating 16 months ago, but have been forced to as a result of, you know, being more intentional about how they work to keep their employees safe. And now we, we have this great chance to say, okay, look, like this, this really worked. Like you digitized your workflows, you saved money, you still met your schedules, even though, you know, we're rife with uncertainty of the industry. So it's, it's just kind of this great moment to strike. And I'm seeing more and more new roles that didn't exist in construction a few years ago, focused on data and analytics and having people very specifically focused on these skill sets, regardless of where they come from in the industry. So I think there's a ton of opportunity, and it really just comes down to the work dynamic that you create and the people that you choose to, to you know, lead those organizations. And so... I'm rambling about construction technology, so let's let's make a little bit of a pivot to uh, to some of the tools. And I'd like to keep that hypothetical owner in mind for this next question. So, can you overview your approach for evaluating the different technology tools that allow your team to actually build so many sustainable units by 2030? So, what's worked for your team and what hasn't? What's uh, what's been working for us right now is um, really we've gone through and we've started defining the outcomes we're, we're trying to achieve. Uh, we've started measuring those outcomes, analyzing them and really looking at what sort of continuous improvement we can we can build upon that uh, to do that. Uh, there's a heavy cost, um, as we spoke about earlier, of when we pick out these technologies, we actually have to test that. You know, we, we've set out our metrics for for what we want. Now we've got to put some of this stuff to the test. And what we look for is, you know, these stop gates. If, if a certain product or technology isn't working out, then we need a go, no go process in there. Um, what's worked well for us is the, the tools that um, aren't always needing that mass convergent uh, between the two technologies, or multiple technologies. Often we, we find that to be the case and the technologies that are more robust to manage the uh, different levels of job functions within our organization and outside of our organization seem to be the ones that are making giving us the success we're achieving. That intentionality around what you choose, especially with the stakeholder in mind when it comes to who's using that technology is, is so important. I would like to add to that. And, you know, it is an owner program requirement. It is design guidelines. It's a lot of things. It's getting the right people asking the right questions. But years ago, I was in a class and uh, Robert Schiller uh, was a guest speaker and he is the um, world renowned economist at Yale who developed the uh, Case Schiller Index. And he said, the two greatest technologies in the United States is law, it's our legal system and finance, the capital markets. And I'll never forget that. He referred to those as technologies. And so when you look at multi-green, those are the two things we've really tried to um, specialize in first and foremost to get our contract environment correct and our assumptions correct. So whether we're looking at design build or GMAX contracts of some kind, eventually migrating to an IPD, that's where we think uh, we'll eventually get to 
um, the higher volumes that we're needing, but also getting those specific legal agreements into the right financial model. And it's not financial modeling at the end of the day, it's input testing. But we frequently tell you know all of our vendors and, and stakeholders that we're technologists first and finance, finance professionals second. And with that order and in that order, we then can create an environment for success. I like that approach to collaboration. And you, and you mentioned IPD, which always makes my ears perk up when I'm having these conversations, because I think that uh, at least I consider it kind of an I ideal state for construction because the incentives for collaboration change so dramatically when you set up your, your contracts, and your agreements, and your relationships with that intentionality. And so I'm, I'm happy to hear that that's, you know, where you're looking and hoping the future heads. Um, and, and thankfully, things like IPD hopefully prevent the, uh, the tra traditionally the litigious um, structure of a lot of these contract vehicles, which I don't think uh, lend to you know, the, the sustainable outcomes that we're looking for here. So as a, as a former AEC proposal manager myself, I've, I've seen many different approaches to building projects, specifically when it comes to owner's requirements for construction technology. Can you share more about how your team handles the RFP or request for proposal stage when you're looking for new partners and what you mandate in, uh, in those contracts to ensure you're using the right technologies? I'll take it. So when we're looking at uh, during that RFP process, uh, we, we have a, a weighted scorecard uh, between cultural technology and price, um, depending on what we're doing with the individual partners uh, with culture and technology weighted the greatest. So we're not always looking at the cheapest price. We want certainty in our price. We want the relationships to be strong. We don't want any breakdown in communications. And certainly we want to know that uh, they have uh, they are tech enabled or they are willing to to bring themselves up to speed with the tools that we are offering and ideally that they're going to be bringing some innovation tools back to us. Um, in that process, I'll talk a little bit on the technical side. Previously, we we're trying to manage all this communication via email. Um, we've now started to veer away from all that and we're using another system that enables us to, to go through and have transparency across all the members uh, of the team and people that are invited to bid, uh, going through a workflow process of, of bidding, uh, reviewing the bids, approval, and then awarding those bids. So that that's made things so much smoother for us uh, working in that sort of environment rather than going to something that's sitting with emails or even just snail mail, if you will. So, and that's part of that lean culture. We're looking for those tools that help automate help bring transparency uh, and communicate uh, better to our stakeholders. It's music to my ears as a, as a for, former proposal manager because the, the process of getting, you know, that final package put together and out the door was, uh, let's just say stressful <laughs> at, the, at the very least. And the, the weighting of not just price is, is such a refreshing thing to hear. There was a window in my, my background where I was fully focused on um, federal bids and the term lowest price technically acceptable became very common at the tail end of my tenure in that federal land. And it stung when you'd put the, the greatest proposal together full of betterments for the owner and you really understand their needs. But, you know, Tony's contracting was $200,000 cheaper and boom, they got the project regardless of what the scope was, especially when we were doing firm fixed price projects. So um, I'm, I'm happy to hear that you're not dancing in that space. The other thing that comes up when I'm thinking about owners these days, and I'm doing so a lot, is the, the term digital twin. And it's becoming more common when discussing, you know, owner-driven approaches to construction. And I'm curious, what, deci what decisions should owners be making at the start of the project to ensure they capture the necessary data to successfully operate the building with a digital twin in mind? So... First off, you got to start with the very end. You need to go and talk to your operation facility managers, understand the data that they will utilize, understand the data that's going to be necessary to maintain the building and even to the end of the life cycle of that building. Uh, then you bring all that, uh, that list back to your designers and your planners. And that becomes that generative process about, okay, now we have a shared understanding of what we're trying to achieve. 
that gets taken forward into construction and the construction really becomes the uh, the custodians for collecting all this asset data uh, in addition to the types of systems because um, we're not just doing facility management we're doing digital twinning which means we have all this building data sitting somewhere in a model that's connected and it's connected to the living building out there with sensors of how it's being utilized of how it's being performed and ultimately giving us more intelligence about what we need to do onto the next project you know is is the gym being utilized or overutilized or underutilized do we are we sizing things up appropriately you know we've just gone through a pandemic you know where we have people now working from home do they have the right facilities in their own home so bringing all this intelligent really becomes uh, the strength of a digital twin when we get it right. And I think living in that common data environment that's becoming so much more common is incredibly important now. Uh, I think for any progressive builder at this point, the uh, the days of a turnover package coming in a, a stack of binders and CDs and flash drives and cross fingers, I, I hope is, uh, you know, the, the conversation of yesterday. Uh, and I think uh, just the efficiency there when you're using the right tools to document everything from start to finish is is so impactful because now it's not a you know a, cha a an exploration of where's the data how do we find it did we lose it did a hard drive die now it's just oh cool you were in this platform from the beginning of the project here's your project data you know and uh, and it's it's an encouraging thing to see becoming more common as we you know move into more progressive building methods and and uh, see builders like yourselves putting such impressive projects to the table so well Eric, one of the uh, the challenges though in the marketplace is uh, bringing everyone up to speed on this type of technology you know there's still very much a manual process whether it's uh, going and doing safety inspections it's written on a clipboard brought back to the the office and then it's entered into a computer getting them to, to do this stuff out there in the field with a, a phone or uh, a tablet and being responsible to enter that information directly so that there's accountability and traceability about what's going on and there's no daisy chain or miscommunication of uh, of the information data being inputted and I think that really comes back to training at the end of the day, both with the subcontractors that are on the job, the general contractors and everybody across the site and really showing the value of, OK, this is a little different than what you're used to. But it means that you get to go home sooner because you've spent less time, you know, dragging a big ream of paper around the project. And then also that that accountability, like you said, at the end of the day, you can really show, OK, I did this and it's not lost because I didn't lose my clipboard or didn't spill my coffee on it or you know something like that so the the future i think for construction tech some of it's here now like we are we are living this future and uh and there's so much more coming in the pipe which i think is a great moment to grab our crystal balls and take a peek at what the the future might actually bring um and so randy i'd love to hear your thoughts about what else is coming from a project owner's perspective like what, what do you think the state of the the industry looks like in five years 10 years for owners compared to where we're at today? I would hope that if we were giving, given a mandate uh, to enter any market, whether local or abroad, that we could parachute in and within a very short period of time, call it you know a few days, no longer than a week, be able to fully underwrite, build, design, estimate, procure, buy out a project and have global procurement and supply chain. And that was the mandate that was given to me four years ago um, by my boss. He wanted to be able to say, okay, you know, let's make the world a better place. If we need to go into Papua New Guinea, Guatemala, you know, in the sub-Saharan Africa, how are we gonna really make a difference five, 10, 20 years from now? And what we decided to do is to prove the model here during this decade, and when we have a chance to recalibrate our goals and align ourselves as a goalkeeper um, with the UN SDGs come 2030, we will pivot and look to other markets that we might be able to enter. We'll probably start with the Western world, you know, the UK and um, Scandinavia, Australia, and places that we know we're not going to lose our money, um, you know, from corruption or uh, our foreign direct investment will, will be longstanding. 
But the third wave will be going into uh, what we now call third world areas, you know, where there's less opportunity and being able to organize energy intentionally uh, and resources to make the world a better place. And that's, I think, at the end of the day, what Multigreen is all about is we are literally trying to improve the state of the world by constructing 40,000 units that are attainable, sustainable, and tech-enabled. Why? Because this is the Petri dish. If we can't do it here in the United States, we can't do it anywhere in the world. You make a really great point. You're, you're building your framework for that future state that you've just described, which my hope is you're successful and we can implement you know models like this across the board especially since you're so open to sharing your lessons learned with other owners um levi how about you do you have any future focused thoughts that you'd like to share with the world the golden egg is really getting into that model generative design for me you know something that where we have all the building blocks you remember our design catalog of units and being able to put the lego pieces together if we can do that and have it built up with all the cost data, all the uh, the building code data, all the legislation that we need to actually build these products, and it's being generated through an AI system, then we can play out multiple what-if scenarios and optimize what we're trying to do out there in the field, You know, whether it's for our investors or whether we're doing something unique and specific to a local area. You know, Coming up with multiple solutions and being able to evaluate them quickly releases that constipation of looking at one project and trying to value engineer it somehow. So that's ideally uh, the golden egg that I'd like to see uh, coming up in the near future. This is not just a California crisis or a United States crisis. Affordable housing and attainable housing is a global issue. And there's over 200,000 people a day that are moving to what we call mega cities. If you want to look at it from a micro per, you know, economic perspective, there's five people an hour moving from Los Angeles to Las Vegas. This causes infrastructure strain and namely housing. So once our supply chains dethaw from what's happening now in the COVID market, um, right now there's a two month backlog at the Long Beach port because there's not enough employees um, to, to de-dock um, and get all of these shipments onto rail and, and onto our, our uh, interstates. So all of the builders throughout the country are having delays. You know, they estimated that they were gonna be nine months uh, out to deliver a home. Now it's 18, 24 months out. All the while, cost is escalating. So we need to have better certainty in cost, execution, and delivery. It's going the wrong way. We need to be cutting out all of the efficiencies and waste if we have any chance to make this world a better place with affordable housing. It's a, it's an ambitious goal, but most certainly an important one. And I'm very hopeful that the model that you're putting together has an impact, you know, not just like you said here in the United States, but on a global basis. Um, everybody need, deserves to have, you know, a good place to live that's affordable, sustainable. And it's, it's a tough order for a lot of people across the world right now. So I'm, I'm appreciative of what you guys are doing. I've got one more question that I close every episode with. So our listeners are very familiar with this and at this point, but I'd like to hear what is one tool you will always carry in your toolbox, no matter what type of project you're working on. Levi, do you want to kick this one off for us? Sure. So look, contractual agreements are the number one tool I'll take to every single uh, project. You know, it connects us to the relationships we have to be successful for every project. For me, once the contracts are in place that Levi implements, I want to make sure that the financial model is um, matching those inputs and we are managing risk. Um, so between the contract and the financial model, I think that we can really drive a lot of volume. That's not to say those are the two only you know tools that we need, but I will always have a financial model up um, in the background running sensitivity analysis when there's RFIs or other changes. It's good. And you can always tell what our stakeholders are um, most concerned about or what helps their their worldview and their job based on their answers to these two questions. And it, it changes every episode. So I really appreciate you sharing those with us. So do either of you have anything you'd like to plug that our listeners should know about? I would just like to say our goal, our stated goal publicly 
is to uh, create 40,000 units by 2030. Internally, we have much more ambition than that. So, you know, follow us at Think Multi Green and subscribe at www.multi.green because with your participation, we can exceed our goal. Great. I am already a follower, but I think everybody listening should check it out if they've got an opportunity. Levi, is there anything you'd like to share with our listeners? We are always looking for, you know, innovative uh, partners and, you know, tech enabled partners uh, through all this. Um, we need more out there uh, in the industry. Um, those that aren't only willing to, to collaborate with us, but also bring something new to the table and let us get a different view of, of what's out there. All right. It sounds like our guests are eager to hear from you, which leads right into my next question of how can our listeners connect with you if they feel inclined to do so? Well, for me, uh, you can reach me at the email address, think at multi.green. And uh, for me, you can actually reach out to me at imagine at multi.green. I love it. Aspirational email addresses for an incredibly aspirational organization. So thanks for taking the time to join me on the show today, guys. And for everybody out there listening, as always, if you want to reach out to me with any questions or want to appear on an episode, you can find me on LinkedIn or via Twitter at builder underscore digital. Also, make sure to check out our new homepage by visiting construction.autodesk.com forward slash podcast. There you can sign up for our biweekly newsletter and even suggest show topics or guest ideas and finally please like subscribe to or share this episode if you enjoyed it it really helps out my team when you do that so i'd really appreciate it and on that final note goodbye you've been listening to digital builder to ensure that you never miss an episode subscribe to the show in your favorite podcast player if you're listening with apple podcasts we'd love for you to give a quick rating of the show Simply tap the number of stars you think the podcast deserves, and then you're done. Thank you so much for listening. Until next time.